Hello again everyone and uh, thanks for uh, for watching and uh, while I'm thinking about it uh, a special thanks to my new subscribers um, I don't uh, I don't ask for subscribers I don't solicit subscribers I don't beg for subscribers so anybody that hits the subscribe button is interested in what I have to say they don't feel obligated they have to do it so uh, thanks again for everybody that's that's subscribed. Um, in this video, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about uh, Kim Il Sung and uh, three things that I find remarkable about the man. Now, I'm not going to talk ideology here. Ideology is a quite separate thing, um, and I'm going to kind of stay away from that. I just want to talk about uh, Kim Il uh, Kim Il Sung, the man and what he accomplished and why I find it remarkable and uh, I just want to make three points um, as you know Kim Il-sung the eternal president of um, uh, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and um, I believe he died in 1994 19, born in uh, April 15th 1912 died in 1994 um, has an interesting uh, biography, and I'm going to at some point set about reading it here. Uh, it's called With the Century, and so far I've found eight volumes, and they total uh, something like uh, 3,500, 3,700 words in the volumes. And actually I perused it here and there, and it's very readable. It's, there's nothing dry about it. And very little ideology, as a matter of fact. He just talks about events, what happened. And um, so, uh, you know, at some point I'm going to get started on that when I find the time. Um, the first thing I find interesting about Kim Il-sung is that he was a revolutionary who started a country. Now, very f few revolutionaries actually start a country. And, uh, mostly uh, a revolutionary come along uh, and people get tired of the old government, uh, the corrupt old way. So the revolutionary usually shoots his way into office. And he uh, executes uh, a bunch of people and puts his own people in place. But basically when a revolutionary takes over, um, all the institutions are in place and they remain in place. Uh, the, the bureaucracy, the police, the military, uh, you know, the civil service, the mail keeps getting delivered, that sort of thing. Uh, it's just that now there's a new crew in charge. Uh, for example, uh, Vladimir Lenin, you know, in 1917, he took over and uh, uh, shot a bunch of people, put his people in place. And he renamed the country uh, the USSR, but it was still Russia, and now it's Russia today. Uh, not much changed. Same thing with Fidel Castro. He came down out of the mountains and, and took over from Batista, but it was still Cuba. Um, the revolution, the Iranian revolution in 1979, when the uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, when he took over, uh, that was actually a fairly nonviolent revolution. Um, and, uh, you know, a pro-Western authoritarian monarchy uh, was replaced by an anti-Western authoritarian theocracy. Not much change, just the players. And, um, but what's interesting about Korea is that between the years of 1910 and 1945, Korea was the property of Japan. Uh, Korea had been incorporated into Japan. Korea lost its identity. Uh, the Korean people lost their culture. Their culture was subsumed into that of Japan. And the Japanese treated the Koreans worse than farm animals. They treated them like slaves. And uh, so when Kim Il-sung came along, um, he had a big challenge. He had to defeat the Japanese, which uh, actually the United States, when they won World War II, Japan was totally defeated and gave up all its colonies and property and territory, and so Korea reverted back. But uh, Kim Il-sung still was left with 
a country without. And he had to start over and uh, build the country. And the second problem that I find interesting with Kim Il-sung is he was faced then with separating the sheep from the goats, finding out who were the good guys, who were the bad guys, who was for him, who was against him. Um, and there are times when you put yourself in the position of being a revolutionary leader, there are times when you do things you might necessarily not want to do, but you have to do them. You know, you have to because the people in opposition to you aren't Boy Scouts. You know, they're trying to kill you. So you got to kill them first. I mean, that's just the way it is. You know, you've got to do it to them before they do it to you. It's a tough world. Um, and I think probably Kim Il-sung's, although I'm not sure, like I say, I haven't read the, uh, his autobiography, but I believe he had the, he, 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 uh, his guiding principle was, um, if you're not part of the solution, then you're part of the problem. In other words, if you aren't with us, you're against us. And that's the way he separated the sheep from the goats. And uh, the people who, um, who weren't with him, you know, they got put behind barbed wire. Simple as that. Uh, it's like Franklin Delano Roosevelt when he, during World War II, the beginning of World War II, he wasn't quite sure if Japanese American people were with the United States or working against the United States. So what did Roosevelt do? He put him behind barbed wire. Same thing as Kim Il Sung on a much smaller scale, but Franklin Delano Roosevelt did what he thought he needed to do. And the man was a Democrat and a liberal. So there you go. Um, you know, in, an or in, in peacetime, if you're an ordinary politician, uh, you can debate your opposition. You know, you can go back and forth. It's a give and take. You negotiate. You kind of reach a consensus. Uh, and then it's some kind of agreement. But when you're in a time of war, a time of turmoil, a time of revolution, you can't debate your opposition. You have to eliminate your opposition. It's just as simple as that. And, um, you know, a, revolutionary, a revolution is a violent affair. It's a, you know, people are trying to kill each other. And, uh, you know, the way I look at it, I look at revolution as being somewhat, I would look at it from a Darwinian perspective, is that revolutions inevitably happen. Uh, revolutions are just like hurricanes or earthquakes, floods, that sort of thing. It's a natural phenomena. And uh, when a revolution decides to happen, there's nothing you can do to stop it. Um, we know what causes revolution, just like we know what causes you know, hurricanes, floods, and earthquakes. Uh, conflict. That's what causes, same thing that causes an earthquake, you know, two parts of the Earth's crust conflicting against each other. The same thing causes a revolution. You know, conflict. Uh, you have one group that's in absolute power, and they're exploiting another group that has no power. At some point, the group without any power gets upset, runs out of patience at being exploited, and rises up and kills the group that's in power. Simple as that. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, he thought that uh, revolutions were a cyclical thing. He thought that they would occur naturally in America at some point. You know, every 50, 100 years, there'd be a revolution. And uh, his famous saying was, uh, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. Now, that's Thomas Jefferson. You know, he wrote the Declaration of Independence and had a big hand in writing the Constitution. Um, Jefferson was a big fan of the revolution, of the French Revolution of 1789. And that was a bloody, bloody mess. That thing, whew. You know, I read about it. Just a lot, a lot of people died. Um, in the aftermath of a revolution, what happens when any one group 
gains power and the other group loses is the aftermath can be pretty messy as well. And uh, for instance, in the American Revolution, uh, before the revolution, during the revolution, uh, it wasn't quite as popular as people think. There were a lot of people that were loyal to the crown, that were loyal British subject in America, that were Tories. They didn't want to split with Great Britain. Mostly these were the landed gentry. These are people that had money. They were the merchant class, their upper classes. They had land. Uh, they were doing just fine. And so they didn't like the idea of a revolution. And they were mostly surprised when the revolution succeeded. And that was a kind of a surprise. What happened in the aftermath of the American Revolution is that most of those Tories, those British subjects that were happy being British, didn't want to be American, uh, overnight they lost everything. And uh, the revolutionaries that now won, um, they ran them out because they weren't on the side of the revolution. In other words, back to Kim Il-sung, you're either for us or against us. And it turned out that the British, the American Tories, um, loyal to the crown, they chose the wrong side of the revolution. And a lot of them uh, had to run for Canada with only the clothes on their back. They lost everything. And so Canada today is populated by a lot, a lot of Americans that had to flee the colonies and go to Canada because they were on the losing side. So that's what happens. Um, and, uh, it, it, you know, it's just, it's just the way it goes. Here's, here's something else that, that I find interesting about. Uh, this is the third thing that I find interesting about Kim Il-sung. And maybe this fascinates me most of all, is that when Korea was divided in North and South, and uh, there was a, an agreement between Stalin and Truman how it would go, and it didn't quite work out the way they wanted it to go. They had problems with the voting, who would vote, this, that, whatever. And finally the line was drawn, and uh, Stalin, he, he got the north of Korea, and the Americans got the south. And the Americans installed a fellow by the name of Syngman Rhee, who the man was clinically insane, in my opinion. He was a total psycho. Uh, everywhere he looked, he saw a communist. And whenever he saw a communist, he killed the person. Uh, Syngman Rhee slaughtered a lot, a lot, a lot of people in South Korea. You know, maybe upwards of a couple, three million. But he slaughtered a lot of people. In the North, Kim Il-sung, uh, and back to, back to the South for, for just a second, uh, and the Americans installed Syngman Rhee. Then the Americans, in effect, colonized South Korea just like they'd colonized Japan. So today, the Americans are still in South Korea. Their military is still in South Korea, and they control a lot of South Korea uh, politics, the military. Um, South Korea is loath to do anything to displease the Americans. So they have to follow the American line. Uh, they have to check with Washington before they do anything. And uh, the Americans have the, the military there. And so South Korea, in many ways, has been thoroughly Americanized. Same thing with Japan. But what's remarkable, in North Korea, after the dust settled, uh, then Kim Il-sung invited the Russians to leave and to a certain extent the Chinese. And surprisingly, they left. And I find that amazing. I ought to find out why that is. Now, when the war started in, in June 25th, 1950, eventually the Russians came in on the side of North Korea, of course, and the Chinese came in as well. But that was only not so much to defend North Korea as because neither the Russians nor the Chinese like the idea of Americans having military bases up on the border, staring down at them. And that's basically why they came in. Um, not so much to rescue North Korea, because if the Americans had stopped, 
in October of 1950 if they had stopped at the DMZ after they chased the North Koreans back over the DMZ, if they would have stopped, the Russians or Chinese never would never come in. That would have been it. But the Americans had to push all the way up north of the Yellow, Yellow River and the Tumen, and when they did that, then that brought Chinese and Russians in. But otherwise, the Russians and the Chinese have pretty much stayed out of North Korea, military-wise. You don't see any bases there. And North Korea is, has been on its own ever since the end of the war. I mean, China and, and Russia have helped them economically and, uh, and politically and diplomatically, but not to the extent that the Americans have, have controlled what's going on in, North, in South Korea. So this is kind of interesting. And so today we look at it and we think, well, here we are again. You know, we have South Korea with the Americans and other allies, including the United Nations. They're all on the side of South Korea. Nobody is on the side of North Korea. Um, the Russians kind of make a little noise about it. And so do the Chinese. But basically, just like in 1948, after Kim Il-sung declared the country to be a sovereign nation um, in September of 1948, then North Korea has been on its own. And, and, you know, I find that remarkable. And that the fact that they've survived being on their own, a poor country, um, a lot of problems, gone through a war, gone through famine, gone through just all kinds of upheavals. And they still managed to survive. And the explanation for that you don't find in ideology. There's something else that makes it cause these people to survive. And you can't say, well, it's due to their belief system or their, idea, <coughs> their politics or whatever. There's something else involved. And that's what fascinates me about the country. So anyway, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. The three interesting things I find about uh, uh, Kim Il-sung is that you know, he started a country from scratch and he was able to consolidate the country after the revolution, separate the sheep from the goats, and then finally he was able to keep foreign influence out of the country. And uh, so those are the three things. I'm sure there's more. And you can think of a few as well. But those are the three main things I find interesting. And it doesn't have anything to do with ideology or very little. But it has to do with basically the skill of Kim Il-sung as a leader, uh, his leadership qualities. So anyway, give you something to think about. And uh, I'll leave it there for the moment. And uh, as always, uh, thanks for watching and thanks for subscribing. And I'll see you in the next video.